Hi, I'm Amy Komicher, and welcome to our first web seminar in our series Sustainable Production and Distribution of Bioenergy for the Central USA. Today we have Dr. Robert Brown, who is an expert in thermochemical conversion of biomass to biofuels, and that is part of what Dr. Brown will discuss today. I would like to take a minute to thank USA and the USDA for funding this webinar. With that, I will let Dr. Brown have the floor. Today I'm going to be talking about thermochemical conversion of biomass. Uh, one of the reasons I'm focusing on that is that is my area of specialty. Another reason is uh, I think many people have heard a lot about cellulosic ethanol or cellulosic biofuels in the context of, of using biochemical or biological approaches to conversion. Thermochemical is an area that is growing in just recent years. Uh, it's actually uh, technology in many respects has been around for some time, uh, maybe not as long as the fermentation of sugars to, uh, to ethanol, which uh, goes back millennia, but uh, it dates back at least a couple of hundred years. Uh, if you're interested in a more general uh, view of biofuels, uh, I'm going to give a little advertisement for a book I wrote last year called Why Are We Producing Biofuels, which is intended for a more general, less specialized audience. Uh, it's something that's available on uh, Amazon.com. But I will be focusing on the thermochemical conversion uh, part of this, uh, this field. On this first slide, I uh, am illustrating a few uh, a, a few pictures out of our own laboratory, uh, including some pilot scale facilities. And pointer. Paul, I don't think I can get this pointer to work. But oh, just click on this. Very good. Oh, and it'll point at. Very good. Okay, so there is our pilot scale gasifier, which is one of the technologies that I'll be talking about. Uh, let me start by defining drop-in biofuels, which there, there's quite a bit of talk of that, and sometimes people aren't fully understanding what that might mean. Drop-in drop biofuels is merely, looks like it wants me to grab that. Okay, just click, where, okay. Uh, drop-in biofuels is defined as fuels that are, are fully compatible with existing fuel infrastructure. So the idea is that rather than having the uh, restrictions that are often placed on ethanol, for example, where you can't put it in pipelines and you have to blend it uh, close to the source of the use, uh, these can be treated just like the gasoline and diesel we do today. And generally there are, are two possibilities. One is would be hydrocarbons, which is what uh, gasoline and diesel are. Another possibility that is being explored is butanol. Now, ethanol, uh, butanol is just uh, a slightly uh, longer uh, alcohol than is ethanol. Uh, and it is not an exact drop in biofuels, but it certainly extends the possibilities for using alcohol fuels in transportation. Now, are any drop in fuels the perfect fuel? And I would say it's close enough uh, for the purposes that we wish to achieve. I want to define thermochemical processes. Uh, I call this the use of heat and catalyst to convert biomass to biofuels. And this contrasts with biochemical processing, how we today produce uh, grain ethanol, which uses enzymes and microorganisms to accomplish uh, this conversion. Uh, here's an outline of my talk today. I'm going to start with discussing the feedstock options. Um, we are talking about feedstocks other than the traditional use of soybeans and corn. So I want to give a good understanding of what those options are. I, I want to describe the important attributes of, of feedstocks that are appropriate for thermochemical processing. I want to describe the various thermochemical processing pathways. There are actually very uh, many for us to consider. And I want to identify some specific uh, thermochemical biofuels projects that are underway at the commercial scale. Now this involves 
identifying companies that are working in thermal chemical fuels and then going one step further and looking at those companies that have advanced enough in their technology development that they are building or have built commercial plants. Let's start with the kinds of biomass. Uh, I'll define them as lignocellulosic biomass, and this is material that uh, is essentially uh, uh, fibers. Uh, it would include things like wood fibers and the fibers that you would find from uh, grasses, switchgrass, for example. In contrast, there's a, something we call lipid-rich biomass. Uh, think of soybeans. Uh, it's rich in lipids. It is not the primary component of soybeans. The primary component of soybeans is actually uh, protein. Uh, the biomass that we're looking specifically at uh, is microalgae. Um, I call that the soybean of the sea because it also is not primarily lipid, although that is where most of the discussion is around uh, microalgae. It is actually most more protein than, than lipid. And then the third category is waste biomass, which is essentially a mixture of the different kinds of components we normally find in biomass, and that would include cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, protein, starch, uh, lipids, uh, et cetera. And this is one that I'm not going to talk too much more about, uh, primarily because uh, <clears throat> It is, uh, it is actually a fairly complicated feedstock, even though it, it is the cheapest. Sometimes it's uh, free. Sometimes uh, you'll even be paid to use it, to take it off the hands of, of the organization that's generating the material. Let's start with the lignocellulose. Here's an illustration. <clears throat> of lignocellulose. It is, is a three-dimensional polymeric composite that, because of the way uh, it is constructed, is naturally recalcitrant to biological degradation. And that makes sense. You go walk through the forest and you see a downed tree, and you come back next year and you'll probably still see that downed tree. It will have decomposed, uh, but you'll s still see some of the components there, primarily the lignin. So if you look inside the structure, you see these, these uh, blue lines, which represent uh, fibers of cellulose. They're interconnected with um, hemicellulose, which is also a polymeric material. And then it is surrounded by um, <clears throat> lignin. And lignin is the glue of, of this uh, lignocellulosic material. And it's actually the part that is most recalcitrant uh, a, a tree decomposing will leave uh, will decompose primarily the semicellulose and hemicellulose and leave the lignin behind. And that's, in fact, uh, some of the difficulties that are encountered when using lignocellulose biologically is uh, the enzymes have difficulty getting in to reach the cellulose and the hemicellulose, and the lignin is essentially uh, non reactive or uh, is not consumed by these microorganisms. Uh, the key, though, once you get into the cellulose, is cellulose simply consists of chains of, of glucose. So here's a glucose, um, uh, a glucose molecule and another one, and they're connected by a glycosidic bond. And the key is breaking these bonds to liberate individual sugars. Looks like my whole slide isn't getting on here. Full screen. I'm going to go to full screen, see if that changes it. Yeah, that helps. Okay. And wonder if I can reduce the size of it. I'm not catching my whole screen. I don't know if I can shrink it some. Oh, right here. Yeah. Okay. That looks like that will do it. Very good. The um, Lignocellulosic feedstocks are generally broken down into two options. One is woody biomass, which includes plantation-grown trees and wood waste. Uh, it is currently the lowest cost feedstock in many regions of the United States. And my talk is focusing on the United States. Uh, it has higher density than herbaceous biomass, which I'm going to describe in a minute. 
and it can be stored on the stump. Uh, you think of a, a corn crop and the corn stover is gonna to have to be removed from the field because otherwise it would simply decay. Whereas a, a tree, you can let it stand till you're ready to use it. Herbaceous biomass includes grasses and crop residues. It's the largest lignocellulosic feedstock potential in the US primarily on the merits of all the corn that's grown in the United States. Uh, corn stover is a herbaceous biomass. It's easier to break down biologically than wood. That's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it's a blessing if you're trying to, to convert it. It's a curse if you're trying to store it, of course. And it has more flexibility in cropping. So once you put trees in, you're, you're committed for a while, uh, whereas um, uh, annual herbaceous crop, you can uh, change over to something else every year. Among lipid feedstocks, uh, there are many examples I'm going to show, but uh, what's real exciting about lipid feedstocks, it's nearly hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons is what we uh, traditionally use for the production of, of transportation fuels. So by uh, by hydrocarbon, I mean if you look at the uh, structure of lipids, which is uh, essentially a triglycerides, uh, you'll see it uh, consists of fatty acids, one, two, three fatty acid chains connected to a glycerol background. And if you start looking across here, you'll see carbon and hydrogen, as in um, hydrocarbon and very little oxygen associated with it compared to the carbons and hydrogen. So from that standpoint, this is nearly a hydrocarbon, which would be attracting production of fuels. Now, the real challenge of, of uh, lipid-based fuels is finding cheap and plentiful feedstocks. Uh, and here's some examples. Now, we know how to grow soybeans and rapeseed. It's well developed, but it's relatively low yielding in the big scheme of things. And so we're looking at other alternatives. And I've listed here oil palm, jotropa, ojoba, uh, something called uh, salicornia, which is, uh, grows in, in uh, sea marshes. And if you look at these little, little uh, white uh, buds, those are little uh, lipid uh, collections, uh, sacs. Um, I can't imagine trying to harvest those little lipids off there, but uh, that's the idea. And then microalgae, which gets most of the attention, but all of these are potentially uh, interesting lipid-based, uh, lipid-rich uh, feedstocks. You'll notice that uh, they have various yields we like to see something at least on the order of, of 100 to 200 gallons per acre. Microalgae stands up out for having a potential of 500, uh, 5,500 gallons per acre. Now that beats anything that you can imagine and hence uh, the interest in microalgae. I just had a student in my office this morning showing me what it would, uh, what the cost of cultivating microalgae today is, and, and we're used to thinking of producing lignocellulosic cellulosic feedstocks for under $100 per ton, dry ton. And in the case of microalgae, the number was uh, measured in the thousands uh, of dollars per ton. Yes, that was, it was an order of magnitude higher. So we've got to learn uh, to do the uh, aquaculture of microalgae, just like we have learned to do the ac um, agriculture of lignocellulosic biomass. Uh, this is something of a philosophical slide. <laughs> Lipids versus lignocellulose. Which one of these should we be using? The lipid-rich feedstocks, assuming we can get them down from uh, $1,000 uh, per ton uh, to, to something like $100 per ton or the lignocellulose. And here's what I'd like to point out is what we're focusing on a lot in the US today is taking uh, cellulose and through a process called deoxygenation, we remove oxygen. See all the oxygen up here? We're going to remove that oxygen 
And you see in this, this uh, manufacturing plant, we reject oxygen in the form of carbon dioxide and water uh, and leave behind from this original cellulose, we get a hydrocarbon. All oxygen has been removed. So it seems like this is a lot of work. But I'd like to point out, if we uh, look at uh, living plants that are able to directly produce lipids, we find out they're doing essentially the same thing as done over here. They are deoxygenating uh, carbohydrate. Here's glucose enters the um, biosynthesis, lipid biosynthesis cycle. And you'll see that it is rejecting, in a couple of places, carbon dioxide, ending up with a deoxygenated uh, a molecule, a lipid, that is highly deoxygenated. So it is a legitimate question. Should we let this plant do the deoxygenation or this plant? Which one is the cheapest way to go? And I don't have a full answer to it right now. There is, um, there is some advantage to this, but it does mean we have to be the clever ones to do plant number one versus letting nature be the, the clever one in the second option. This slide is to talk about um, what are ideal thermochemical feedstocks. And I've listed here desirable thermochemical feedstock properties, things like we want to maximize the yield of dry matter, of course. We'd also like to minimize the amount of ash, um, both that that is incorporated within the plant material as well as when we harvest, uh, getting dirt, uh, if you will, onto the outside of the plant, which I call an extrinsic ash. We'd like to influence the amount of lignin in the materials. In some cases, lignin is good. In some cases, it's bad. Uh, nitrogen is usually always bad. Once the plant has stopped growing, we prefer not to have too much nitrogen. Moisture for thermochemical processes is an undesirable. And we really don't want to <clears throat> have a lot of nutrients leave the biomass and go into our processing. And I've listed here, and these are simply my best guesses of the research areas that can uh, influence thermochemical feedstock properties. So I've included plant breeding, crop management, and feedstock logistics. Feedstock logistics means harvesting and transporting and storing feedstocks. And you'll see that uh, plant breeding uh, appears to have the uh, most potential for influencing the largest number of properties, but so does crop management. and to a lesser extent, the feedstock logistics. Again, this is my best guesses as an engineer. We talk to an agronomist, um, might, might claim otherwise. But I think uh, we've had some meetings where we've had a little bit of agreement that this, this um, categorization makes sense. So let's uh, return to the thermochemical processing I'm going to just go to into some detail the different kinds of thermochemical processes that we can consider, but I'd like to first point out the comparative advantages of thermochemical. Now I'm not now I'm not dissing biochemical when I put all of its uh, attributes looking inferior to that to thermochemical. But my job today is to point out why in the world would we be doing thermochemical processing, and here are some of the reasons. When you look at the products that are produced, uh, <clears throat> biochemical processes primarily produce alcohols. They can produce uh, some uh, other products, but it's uh, more difficult to do. There is a lot of work trying to change this uh, characterization of biochemical processing. Thermochemical processing, you want alcohols, we can do that. If you want hydrocarbons, we can do that. The reaction conditions is actually a very um, interesting distinction. Uh, biochemical is usually done at very mild uh, conditions, keep the microorganisms alive, whereas thermochemical are, are very harsh processing conditions. But that harshness means we get very fast reaction times. We look here at the residence time, two to five days to do a fermentation versus 
uh, typically less than an hour to do a thermal chemical, and it may be as, as low as a, a fraction of seconds. Selectivity is the idea of if we take biomass and convert it, what percent of that original biomass actually gets converted into the desired compounds? And biochemical typically is very selective. Thermochemical can produce a wide range of products, and it really depends on how you do it. But this, this is where some of the cleverness comes in in how, how you can uh, build your process to get highly selective results. Uh, we use uh, catalyst in both biochemical and thermochemical processing, not always, but frequently. Catalyst, in this case, is called a biocatalyst for biochemical processing, think enzymes. The costs are somewhere on the order of 50 cents per gallon of ethanol. The idea is to get this down to less than 10 cents. Uh, in fact, just a few cents per gallon. In the case, and, and part of that is recognizing that that's all it is for a catalyst used in thermal chemical processing. And this is a reality today. Sterilization, of course, is very important biochemical. You get the uh, wrong bugs in there and you get the wrong selectivity going on in your reactions. So you have to sterilize. Uh, the harsh conditions of thermal chemical processing means no sterilization is needed. Uh, recycling um, is difficult. We're talking about uh, catalyst in the case, uh, biocatalyst enzymes, in the case of biochemical. Uh, there are both uh, liquid and, and uh, solid catalyst, and solid catalyst are fairly straightforward to recycle. Plant size is a real interesting issue. Traditionally, there's been a lot of talk that uh, biochemical processing is uh, on the order of 2,000 tons per day. And the claim would be that thermal chemical has to be a lot larger than that. And in fact, uh, it is possible uh, with some technologies in thermal chemical to go to fairly small scales. In this case, it's pyrolysis, and I'll talk some more about that. The generalized thermal chemical processing can be viewed this way. We start with a feedstock. We uh, depolymerize it or decompose it into an intermediate that I sometimes refer to as a thermolytic substrate. Um, that substrate can then be upgraded. And we'll see some examples, but uh, thermolytic substrates include things like uh, the syngas that results from gasification, the uh, bio oil that results from pyrolysis. And ultimately, those don't, do not go directly into your automobile. They need to be upgraded to produce a biofuel. So we'll look at how we do those things. Uh, this is how I would describe the various thermochemical processing options. And every uh, researcher presents this a little bit differently. Um, I've tried to keep this a fairly simple subject slides that are so detailed. produce the final products, which I'm focusing on fuels, but we can also produce various chemicals. Now, what's interesting about mixed waste is it is such a complicated mixture of stuff that we, we can look at pyrolysis and subolysis um, and even extraction to get desired products, but it's not particularly attractive because it's hard to optimize for everything that's in there. We're going to see that gasification is attractive for mixed waste because I call it a thermodynamic hammer. We just smash the various molecules in the waste into very simple molecules, uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen, which are <clears throat> able to be used in a synthesis process over a catalyst to produce our desired products. And this is how I show most mixed waste should go, is through gasification. And this is widely recognized in the industry. <clears throat> in the case of lignocellulosic biomass, we can gasify it, pyrolyze it, um, use a process called solvent liquefaction. And pyrolysis and solvent liquefaction taken together is sometimes referred to as direct liquefaction. 
Um, so we'll explore those possibilities. In the case of lipid-rich biomass, there are many options. The one that most focus has been on, on extraction, as in taking soybeans and pressing them to get uh, soy oil out of it. But there is also possibilities of using uh, processes like this uh, savolysis and pyrolysis to also uh, get products out of it. Notice over here that there's a lot of possibilities uh, converting the intermediates that are produced, whether it's a gaseous intermediate, liquid intermediate, or these uh, lipid materials. And that includes a synthesis, fermentation, and a process we'll call hydrotreating. And I'm going to go into some more details on those in the following slides. So let's start with gasification. This is the thermal decomposition of organic matter into flammable gases at temperatures of 700 to 1300 degrees centigrade. This is typically the highest temperature process we'll look at. Some people have proposed a, um, a uh, plasma pyrolysis, which exceeds these temperatures even. But it's, uh, it's a multi-step process that all occurs in a single reactor, starting with uh, heating and drying the material. And gasification actually has a pyrolysis process, which we'll look at in more detail. But this is giving off volatiles from the solids. So we've gone from the solids to these vapors. And then those vapors will react <clears throat> sometimes with the, the char that's produced, as shown here, to produce final gaseous products, which then may further react to change the distribution of the various gaseous products, but the idea of gasification, we go from a solid to a gas, primarily gas product. There are many kinds of gasifiers. I'm focusing on just two because I think these make the most sense in term production of fuels, and we've actually done some economic analysis that focuses on these two. One is a low temperature gasification process versus a high temperature. The low temperature is still high temperature. It's still on the order of 800 degrees centigrade or so. And it takes place in a uh, so-called fluidized bed. This is just basically a bed of sand through which we inject steam, air, oxygen, and it will um, essentially um, fluidize the bed. It, it behaves very much like uh, a fluid would. And we can pump biomass into this system and um, devolatilize it and get a gasification product. A higher temperature reactor uh, simply injects the biomass in a stream of oxygen, and it looks like it's burning. And it, in fact, the first phases is very akin to a, a very uh, rich combustion environment. But ultimately, uh, it doesn't produce mostly carbon dioxide and water. It produces mostly carbon monoxide and <clears throat> hydrogen. Both of these products are called syngas, right? And there are advantages to both of these. The lower temperatures are actually um, easier to construct and operate. The high temperatures uh, have a more efficient production of syngas. I've talked about syngas, short for synthesis gas. The idea is we use this gas to synthesize various uh, products. Uh, this mixture is mostly carbon monoxide and hydrogen. It also, I'm sorry, carbon monoxide and hydrogen it also has carbon dioxide and methane in it, as well as a few other things. This gives you some idea of the composition. And this was our first large-scale gasifier. Uh, <clears throat> in the old days, they let us do things like this. Uh, we don't do it quite that way anymore. Uh, but it was kind of fun. Uh, at ga syn gas, in, and in this case, we were, we were simply burning the syn gas. Normally, what we want to do is clean that syn gas. That flame was yellow because it had tar and particulate in it. And we want to remove those particulates from the syn gas, we want to remove the tar, and we want to go one step further, uh, or, or several steps further. We want to remove trace contaminants, which include uh, metals like potassium and uh, from the system, 
We want to remove sulfur. There's not a lot of sulfur in biomass, but we want to remove it to less than parts, to, to, to on the orders of parts per billion. There is a little bit of nitrogen that we want to remove. And once we've done that, then we can do catalytic synthesis. And I'll talk about that in more detail as we go along. What I've illustrated here, just gives some idea of the complexity of the process, is the gas cleaning system that we have at a pilot plant gas fire at ISU's BioCentury Research Farm, which is six miles from the ISU campus. So it's just a maze of pipes and, and plumbing and vessels uh, to accomplish this. And that all adds up to capital cost. I just want to point that out. Uh, syngas, once it's been cleaned, can be upgraded to fuels. And there's two basic approaches, one I call catalytic and the other I call syngas fermentation. Catalytic is performed at moderate temperatures and high pressures using metal catalyst. Um, it is actually a well understood technology. Uh, there are a number of companies around the world that are exploring this. Uh, two that I'm going to point out is a company called Sundrop Fuels in Colorado and Interchem in Canada. Um, they both use uh, gasification processes to produce the, their uh, intermediate, their syn gas, that is then uh, upgraded. The other possibility is instead of using metal catalyst, which would be in a, a re reactor shown up here, is we use something called syn gas fermentation. And yes, it's a fermentation process. You'll notice here a reactor that uh, has a microorganism that actually consumes gas. So we inject into this reactor, uh, bubble into this reactor, the syn gas, the microorganism that's absorbed in the uh, aqueous solution here, and the microorganisms converted. Uh, this is a really a very uh, unusual and intriguing process. It kind of uh, turns fermentation on its head. We think of fermentation actually uh, comes from a, a French word to indicate that it's generating gas. Instead of generating gas, we're pumping gas into this process. There are three companies in the U.S. that I'm uh, familiar with. There, uh, there may be one or two others uh, that are using syngas uh, to produce uh, bio-based products. Um, all of them at one point looked at biomass gasification. Coscada recently is capitalizing on low natural gas processes, uh, low natural gas prices, and are um, converting it into syngas instead of using biomass for their feedstock. But they all use the same basic idea. Very, very intriguing process. So here's the opportunities and challenges in gasification. There are quite a number of advantages I list here. Uh, why we talked about it even can handle these mixed waste streams. Um, it converts all of the uh, feedstock into syngas, not just the carbohydrate, as happens in biological processes. It produces a uniform intermediate. Whether you're putting lipid or protein in, you end up with, um, with CO and hydrogen as your primary molecules. It's commercially proven, and this was proven with uh, fossil fuels. And it has some advantages in energy integration, which can be very important in making the process efficient. The challenges are the gas cleaning that I point out. All those so-called unit operations add to the capital cost, which is one of the prominent disadvantages. Um, and the process of fuel synthesis occurs at high pressures, which means somewhere along the, the line of this uh, gasification train, you're going to have to get the uh, reactants or the products up to high pressure. And that's still kind of an unresolved question of where best to do that pressurization. But it, it is adds to the expense and complexity. I want to turn to pyrolysis now. Um, what I like about pyrolysis is it lends itself to all kinds of food analogies. This is actually a pizza oven. And, and I view pyrolysis as very much uh, occurring under conditions comparable to how you would prepare a pizza if you if you did your pizza right. Uh, pizzas go into a very hot oven. Now this is a very, very hot uh, pizza oven, 350 to 600 degrees centigrade. But this lower range is uh, close to what you'd cook a pizza at. And some of the reactions, the biomass are very similar to what's happening to, to your pizza when it's cooked. 
But what's different is we make sure we exclude uh, oxygen, not fully, but to a large extent it is excluded. And pyrolysis is the thermal decomposition of organic compounds, and it can produce any number of products. Uh, now I'll go to the backyard to, to talk about what I call pie products. Uh, there are three main products, gas, and I, by this I mean non-condensable gases, like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, it's essentially syngas. There is a solid residue, if you will, uh, which uh, it consists of ash and charcoal, and we, we sometimes call this solid residue biochar. And then there's a liquid um, that's a mixture of uh, volatile compounds as well as non-volatile compounds in the form of an aerosol. We call this bio-oil. <clears throat> and anytime you uh, go in your backyard, if your <clears throat> municipal ordinances allow it, and burn yard waste, you are pr uh, producing bio-oil. This white smoke is bio-oil. So you can see anybody can do it. Uh, your neighbors might not <clears throat> care for it, but um, the trick we do in the lab is capture this smoke and uh, condense it as a bio-oil product illustrated in the next slide. When you, when you condense this stuff, this is what it looks like. Okay. Lots of different organic compounds, and that's actually one of its disadvantages is <clears throat> we'd prefer that it just all be sugar, for example, but it's not. The darkness is due to two things, the lignin-derived compounds. There's also some particulate that lends to the darker color of this material. This just gives some idea of the typical yields of what we call fast pyrolysis. Um, pyrolysis can have a variety of, of yields of solids, liquids, and gases. If we do very fast pyrolysis, we are maximizing the production of oil. And these are weight percent yields that we produce. Okay. Now, bio oil will not go in the an automobile, and so we have to do some upgrading, and there's two approaches to upgrading. One is called catalytic upgrading of bio-oils to biofuels, and I name a couple of companies. There are more, but these are ones that I have some uh, familiarity of what, what they are trying to achieve. Invergent and Phillips 66. Then there's uh, some that are varying the pyrolysis process by mixing catalysts right with the biomass. And this um, has some advantages. There's several companies listed here that are, are attempting this. I want to point out something we're doing specifically at Iowa State. And you say, well, if you're starting with um, cellulose as your feedstock, surely this black looking stuff ought to have some sugars in it. And when we do an analysis, the saccharides come in at about 14 weight percent from wood. And <clears throat> that's interesting, but uh, the question is why there isn't any more sugar than that. And we've discovered that if you look at cellulose, and if you were to decompose cellulose, pure cellulose, through a pathway, you end up with something uh, that is called levoglucosin. This is merely dehydrated glucose. It can be hydrated very simply to glucose, but this is what it wants to produce during pyrolysis. But <clears throat> there, is, um, there are metal cations present in biomass, uh, potassium and calcium, that catalyze the destruction of these so-called pyranose rings to form uh, undesirable small molecules versus this much more desirable sugar molecule. So this is the reason we don't get more sugar out of biomass during pyrolysis. But we found, have found a way to reduce the mineral reactivity and we can increase the sugar yields. And this is what we call pyrolytic syrup. It contains greater than 20 weight percent sugars. Now, if you wanted to ferment this stuff, uh, you'd have to actually dilute it because it's actually too concentrated for a traditional fermentation. But this is evidence that, yes, it is possible to get sugars out of a thermal process, not just <clears throat> biological processes. Pyrolysis will also produce uh, a material we called um, 
phenolic oligomers that comes from the lignin in the biomass. And it looks like tar. It smells like barbecue sauce. Here are the uh, opportunities and challenges of fast pyrolysis. One of the big advantages of pyrolysis is it occurs at atmospheric pressure. The bio oil can be upgraded to hydrocarbons. And we think we can do this at fairly small scale and allow for distributed processing. Some people say, does that mean, um, does that mean, uh, does that mean we could do on-farm processing? Um, my colleague, um, Kwesi Botang at the U.S. Department of Agriculture um, has, um, has a new project that he is uh, going to investigate that question. The challenge is, is the bio oil does have some stability problems and corrosive issues associated with it um, that, that we're exploring how to mitigate. There's a lot of oxygen in the uh, bio oil. Uh, it, is, it is not petroleum. It may look like petroleum, but it's truly a liquid biomass. I'm going to turn now to Savalysis. Um, I also refer to this as solvent liquefaction. This is essentially pyrolysis in a solvent, as I've defined it here. I'll make another <clears throat> cooking analogy. It's essentially a pressure cooker. Uh, we uh, often operate at pressures higher than uh, used for home canning, et cetera. But it's the, it's the same concept. We want to keep the water from boiling, and so we put it under pressure. But we, of course, have to control the pressure, make sure it doesn't get too high a pressure. And, uh, one variation of this solvent liquefaction is in, you could use a number of different solvents in this process, but in this case of hydrothermal processing, the solvent is water. So we call it hot compressed liquid water or supercritical water. And depending on the uh, temperature and pressure that you operate at, defines different kinds of hydrothermal processing options. You can use it to extract certain compounds without breaking them down. Uh, you can fractionate lignocellulose into um, cellulose and lignin. Uh, you can do truly a pyrolysis where you produce a bile crude or you can even gasify with it. So it's a lot of possibilities with it. Uh, it's interesting, there are fewer companies uh, developing this and, and uh, in the US I only know of two one is called Catch Light Energy, and the other is Rhinematics. And both of these are, are startup companies. Now, this Savalysis has its own advantages and challenges. Uh, it can depolymerize biomass to sugars without enzymes. And as we saw, enzymes are fairly expensive. Uh, or it can partially deoxygenate a biomass to produce a bio crude for further upgrading. And from what I've seen, um, these processes have promising economics. Now, the challenge is, is they operate at very high pressures, as we saw in the last slide. And getting biomass into a pressurized reactor is no simple matter. Uh, there's still work needs to be done on recovering and refining the products. And the fun, from what I can see, the fundamental chemistry is not well described at present. I'm going to run through a series of slides fairly quickly here. This is to show the state of the commercialization of thermochemical technologies. And by commercial scale, uh, I'm defining that as greater than 20 million gallons per year. Now, is that large? Well, it's commercial scale, but it's small commercial scale. A, a grain ethanol plant today um, is typically uh, 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 recent one would be up on the order of 100, 100 million gallons per year. Um, but let's remember the first grain ethanol plants were no bigger than, than uh, these thermochemical plants being put together today. And we might expect these to grow to larger capacity in the future. So uh, several commercial 
lies technologies. One is hydrocarbon-based biofuels via, and I apologize, this should read fast pyrolysis. It is not catalytic pyrolysis. That's actually the next slide. So this is fast pyrolysis to produce bio oil, which is then hydro-treated to produce fuel. Uh, there are a couple of upgrading options different companies are approaching. Some companies are using something called a fluid, fluid catalytic cracking. Uh, it's kind of nice because you don't need a separate stream of hydrogen, but it is, uh, it is not very carbon efficient as a result. There's another one that actually adds hydrogen to the upgrading step, and it is very carbon efficient, uh, but you've got to provide hydrogen. Well, that used to be a big issue, but with the low uh, cost of natural gas today, this actually is more and more attractive for, uh, for upgrading. Another possibility, now here's the catalytic pyrolysis. Now remember we defined catalytic pyrolysis is actually mixing um, catalysts right with the biomass or in the vapor stream immediately coming out of the, catalyst, uh, out of the pyrolysis process. And it produces a bio oil that is partially deoxygenated, which makes it easier to upgrade by a hydro treating process. Uh, catalytic pyrolysis is typically using what's called a zeolite catalyst, as identified here. And I'm pointing this one out, distinguished from the previous one, because there are different companies commercializing each of these two processes. This is a gasification pathway, again producing hydrocarbon fuels by a process called fischer tropsch synthesis. Um, this occurs at high pressures, as we've talked about, and produces uh, straight chain alkanes. Uh, there is some waxy hydrocarbons produced that uh, ultimately then have to be hydrocracked. So uh, the irony is gasification breaks down biomass to small molecules that then we build up to bigger molecules, and then we have to break them down again. Uh, and that's a little, uh, that, that bothers a, a lot of academic researchers. Uh, the bottom line is how much it costs. Well, the capital costs uh, are relatively high today, but in, it has uh, many other attributes that still make this an area that's being investigated as a way of producing fuels. It's actually uh, the one thermal chemical technology that was developed at scale. It was done by Nazi Germany and apartheid South uh, Africa. So under uh, economic uh, distress, uh, you can make this process work. This is also gasification pathway, but instead of using the fischer tropsch process directly produce hydrocarbons, it produces methanol. So this is the smallest alcohol that can be synthesized. And it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, it makes it more economically attractive than the previous uh, technology in some respects. But then you have to take the methanol and convert it to gasoline. This has been demonstrated um, in New Zealand several years ago and is actually a, a very attractive uh, product. It actually produces most of its product in the gasoline boiling point range. Uh, it is also possible to produce sugars from cellulose ferment that not to alcohol, but to acetic acid, and then that acetic acid goes through an esterification process uh, followed by a hydrogenation process to produce fuel. Um, and I will, uh, there, is, there is a company actually developing this. Again, what you'll notice, it has a number of unit operations associated with it. So now this brings us to the one, two, three, four companies in the United States that are building plants that are at least 20 million gallons per year capacity. And we see uh, one of them is uh, the Sundrop Fuels is projecting 50 million gallons capacity in their first commercial plant. And these are under construction at these locations shown here. Uh, we're seeing Kior is doing the catalytic pyrolysis. Clear Fuels is doing a gasification process. Sundrop Fuels is doing a gasification process. Zeochem is doing this um, hybrid process of uh, using dilute acid hydrolysis to get sugars that are then fermented to acetic acid, and then there is a synthesis to finally to ethanol. Um, 
These are the uh, four that are actually producing these large plants. Of course, there are a number of companies in the United States that are looking at some of these other pathways, um, but they, have not a, uh, they are not building commercial plants at this time. This gives you an idea of their capital cost. Now, notice I indicate these are small plants, yet these capital costs uh, are comparable to or exceed the cost of grain ethanol plants. And that's one reason we're going to see grain ethanol plants around for some time to come because of these high capital costs. And yet the projections are that if you can find the capital, invest in these large plants, uh, you can uh, make, make them profitable. It's a matter of being able to finance the construction of these expensive plants. So I've, my last slide is simply to, to show that at ISU we are uh, have facilities to, uh, to develop these thermochemical technologies, whether it's pyrolysis. This is a pyrolysis pilot plant. This is a gasification pilot plant. And these are lab scale investigations of these various technologies. And with that, we come to um, questions that I'd be happy to answer.